Political Economy by Frederick Bastiat. This is an excerpt from Chapter One of Harmonies of Political Economy, published 1850. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One, entitled Natural and Artificial Organization. It is quite certain that the mechanism of society, like the mechanism of the heavenly bodies or that of the human frame, is subject to general laws. Does it form a harmonious, organized whole, or rather do we not remark in it the absence of all organization? Is not an organization the very thing which all men of the heart and of the future, all advanced publicists, all the pioneers of thought, are in search of at the present day? Is society anything else than a multitude of individuals placed in juxtaposition, acting without concert, and given up to the movements of an anarchical liberty? Are our countless masses, after having with difficulty recovered their liberties, one after the other, not now awaiting the advent of some great genius to arrange them into a harmonious whole? Having pulled down all, must we not now set about laying the foundation of a new edifice? And yet, it may be asked, have these questions any other meaning than this? Can society dispense with written laws, rules, and repressive measures? Is every man to make an unlimited use of his faculties, even when in doing so he strikes at the liberties of another, or inflicts injury on society at large? In a word, must we recognize in the maxim laissez-faire, laissez-passer, the absolute formula of political economy? If that were the question, no one could hesitate about the solution. The economists do not say that a man may kill, sack, burn, and that society has only to be quiescent, laissez-faire. They say that even in the absence of all law, society would resist such acts, and that consequently such resistance is a general law of humanity. They say that civil and penal laws must regulate and not counteract those general laws the existence of which they presuppose. There is a wide difference between a social organization founded on the general laws of human nature and an artificial organization, invented, imagined, which takes no account of these laws or repudiates and despises them, such as organization, in short, as many modern schools would impose upon us. For, if there be general laws which act independently of written laws, and of which the latter can only regulate the action, we must study these general laws. They can be made the object of a science, and political economy exists. If, on the other hand, society is a human invention, if men are regarded only as inert matter to which a great genius like Rousseau must impart sentiment and will, movement and life, then there is no such science as political economy. There are only an infinite number of possible and contingent arrangements, and the fate of nations must depend upon the founder to whom chance shall have committed their destinies. In order to prove that society is subject to general laws, no elaborate dissertation is necessary. All I shall do is to notice certain facts, which, although trite, are not the less important. Rousseau has said, Il fait beaucoup de philosophie pour observer la fée qui sont trop près de nous. Quote, Much philosophy is needed to observe accurately things which are too near us. End quote. And such are the social phenomena in the midst of which we live and move. Habit has so familiarized us with these phenomena that we cease to observe them unless something striking and exceptional forces them on our attention. Let us take by way of illustration a man in the humble walks of life, a village carpenter, for instance, and observe the various services he renders to society and receives from it. We shall not fail to be struck with the enormous disproportion which is apparent. The man employs his day's labor in planing boards and making tables and chests of drawers. He complains of his condition. Yet, in truth, what does he receive from society in exchange for his work? 
First of all, on getting up in the morning, he dresses himself, and he has himself personally made none of the numerous articles of which his clothing consists. Now, in order to put at his disposal this clothing, simple as it is, an enormous amount of labor, industry, and locomotion, and many ingenious inventions must have been employed. Americans must have produced cotton, Indians indigo, Frenchmen wool and flax, Brazilians hides, and all these materials must have been transported to various towns where they have been worked up, spun, woven, dyed, etc. Then he breakfasts. In order to procure him the bread which he eats every morning, land must have been cleared, enclosed, labored, manured, sown. The fruits of the soil must have been preserved with care from pillage, and security must have reigned among an innumerable multitude of people. The wheat must have been cut down, ground into flour, kneaded and prepared. Iron, steel, wood, stone must have been converted by industry into instruments of labor. Some men must have employed animal force, others water power, etc. All matters of which each, taken singly, presupposes a mass of labor, whether we have regard to space or time, of incalculable amount. In the course of the day, this man will have occasion to use sugar, oil, and various other materials and utensils. He sends his son to school, there to receive an education, which, although limited, nevertheless implies anterior study and research, and an extent of knowledge which startles the imagination. He goes out, he finds the street paved and lighted. A neighbor goes to law with him, he finds advocates to please his cause, judges to maintain his rights, officers of justice to put the sentence in execution, all which implies acquired knowledge and consequently intelligence and means of subsistence. He goes to church. It is a stupendous monument, and the book which he carries thither is a monument perhaps still more stupendous of human intelligence. He is taught morals, he has his mind enlightened, his soul elevated, and in order to this we must suppose that another man had previously frequented schools and libraries, consulted all the sources of human learning, and while so employed had been able to live without occupying himself directly with the wants of the body. If our artisan undertakes a journey, he finds out, in order to save him time and exertion, other men have removed and leveled the soil, filled up valleys, hewed down mountains, united the banks of rivers, diminished friction, placed wheeled carriages on blocks of sandstone or bands of iron, and brought the force of animals and the power of steam into subjection to human wants. It is impossible not to be struck with the measureless disproportion which exists between the enjoyments which this man derives from society and what he could obtain by his own unassisted exertions. I venture to say that in a single day he consumes more than he could himself produce in ten centuries. What renders the phenomenon still more strange is that all other men are in the same situation. Every individual member of society has absorbed millions of times more than he could himself produce, yet there is no mutual robbery. And if we regard things more nearly, we perceive that the carpenter has paid in services for all the services which others have rendered to him. If we bring the matter to a strict reckoning, we shall be convinced that he has received nothing which he has not paid for by means of his modest industry, and that every one who, at whatever interval of time or space, has been employed in his service, has received, or will receive, his remuneration. The social mechanism, then, must be very ingenious and very powerful, since it leads to this singular result that each man, even he whose lot is cast in the humblest condition, has more enjoyment in one day than he could himself produce in many ages. Nor is this all. The mechanism of society will appear still more ingenious if the reader will be pleased to turn his regards upon himself. I suppose him a plain student. What is his business in Paris? How does he live? It cannot be disputed that society places at his disposal food, clothing, lodging, amusements, books, means of instruction, a multitude of things, in short, which would take a long time not only to produce, but even to explain how they were produced. 
and what services has this student rendered to society in return for all these things which have exacted so much labor toil fatigue physical and intellectual effort so many inventions transactions and conveyances hither and thither why none at all he is only preparing to render services why then have so many millions of men abandoned to him the fruits of their positive effective and productive labor here is the explanation the father of this student who was a lawyer perhaps or a physician or a merchant had formerly rendered services it may be to society in china and had been remunerated not by immediate services but by a title to demand services at any time in the place and under the form that might be most suitable and convenient to him it is of these past and distant services that society is now acquitting itself and astonishing as it seems if we follow in thought the infinite range of transactions which must have had place in order to this result being effected we shall see that every one has been remunerated for his labor and services and that these titles have passed from hand to hand sometimes divided into parts sometimes grouped together until in the consumption of this student the entire account has been squared and balanced is not this a very remarkable phenomenon we should shut our eyes to the light of day did we fail to perceive that society could not present combinations so complicated and in which civil and penal laws have so little part unless it obeyed the laws of a mechanism wonderfully ingenious the study of that mechanism is the business of political economy end of political economy by frederick bastia recorded by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana in October 2018.